Hello everybody and welcome to Ancient Architects. Please subscribe now to get the latest ancient history news and independent research from around the world. My video that was published at the end of July showed the world the interior of the Great Pyramid Queen's Chamber Northern Shaft for the very first time and has already had more than 430,000 views opening up a lot of new conversations around the Great Pyramid. Because of this video, I've received dozens of emails, tweets and Facebook messages and a number of fantastic authors and researchers have been in touch. And whilst I do plan to do a follow-up video in the near future on the anomalies inside, detailing all the observations and ideas that have been offered, such a video is still some way off. But one person who got in touch was the brilliant French architect Jean-Pierre Houdin who, for some time now, has probably been the closest thing to a hero for me. And that's all because of his work on the Great Pyramid. Houdan has, without a doubt, the best explanation for exactly how the Great Pyramid was constructed with the technology, tools and materials available to Old Kingdom Egyptians. After sharing many emails back and forth, I can honestly say I've learned more about the Great Pyramid in the past few weeks than I have in the past few years. Houdan has studied this structure for more than 20 years in a level of detail like no other. For example, in one correspondence, he showed me a diagram of the walls of the Queen's Chamber explaining why certain blocks have certain shapes and sizes why cracks are in specific locations in the walls, how the load is spread and so on. The level of detail is incredibly meticulous because his background as an architect has allowed him to see this structure in a very unique way. His work on the pyramid construction means he has been able to explain and incorporate every single feature and every single anomaly and he has built a coherent, logical and straightforward explanation. He has worked out how much labour would have been needed to build the Great Pyramid, how blocks would move quickly and efficiently, how the huge granite beams would reach their destination, and how long the project took to complete. Timing it stage by stage, fully understanding the limitations of human labour and ancient technology. Numbers are not plucked out of the air, but calculated based on evidence. It's logical, realistic and believable. These days I am usually first to pick holes and find problems with Great Pyramid theories. It's what I have to do because I genuinely want to understand the truth. And it's why I turn my back on so many of my early ideas from years gone by. Because with more research and more knowledge, ideas have to evolve. Unless you are fully armed with all the information from day one, I fail to understand how any researcher doesn't evolve their ideas. But with my own speculative and critical mind, as of right now, I am still unable to find one fundamental problem with Houdan's work. And I assure you I've certainly tried looking for one. With most Great Pyramid theories, the devil is always in the detail. But getting into the detail is exactly what Jean-Pierre Houdan has done, leaving no stone unturned. If he encounters a problem or an anomaly, he doesn't quietly skirt around it and hope nobody notices. He takes it on and finds a logical interpretation, ensuring his construction model for the Great Pyramid evolves accordingly. He has constantly refined his work, and with each revision, his model becomes more and more credible. Understanding one part of the pyramid generally means you can understand another more clearly. As he said to me, the more I advance, the more it becomes clear the fat being removed. I still have a lot to learn from Jean-Pierre Houdin, but you'll be happy to hear that in time, I will be sharing all of this information with all of you, the viewers of the Ancient Architects channel. It will be a huge project, a huge amount of work to be able to explain every detail of the Great Pyramid's construction, and I will attempt to explain it in a way that everyone, including people of different backgrounds, with different levels of knowledge and understanding, can understand this work, but without glossing over any specific section. I will include all of the detail, but try and explain it in a way that everyone can understand. 
This could either be a huge documentary, or I think it might work best as a series. Starting from how the land was prepared, all the way through to how the final capstone was placed on top. And explained within the limitations of the time, and the known capabilities of the Old Kingdom Egyptians. The people responsible for the Great Pyramid were geniuses. Houdan himself is in awe of what they achieved. And, after learning so much in the past few weeks, the picture is becoming clearer and clearer. The level of knowledge and understanding doesn't come overnight. It's from more than 20 years of detailed study by a professional architect, who has analysed the chambers, corridors and shafts of the Great Pyramid, and modelled it block by block on computer software. Why do the courses of stone have varying thicknesses? Where are the ramps that were used to build the Great Pyramid? How did they lift these huge megaton granite blocks to above the King's Chamber? Why is there a big void directly above the Grand Gallery? How did they put the capstone on top? What are these strange sockets in the Grand Gallery? The questions concerning the Great Pyramid go on and on. Well, some people want exciting explanations, whether Egyptological or alternative, and yes, I do understand that, but personally, I just want logical and straightforward answers, and for all the questions I've asked Jean-Pierre Houdin, I have to say I received just that, a logical and straightforward answer. So that's a teaser for what's to come on the Ancient Architects channel in the future. But because the Queen's Chamber shafts have been a very specific part of the Great Pyramid, very much in my mind for the past few months, I wanted to know Jean-Pierre Houdin's view, and make this standalone video on his explanation. As many of you know, there are so many ideas already out there, there is so much to think about and consider, a lot of ideas but also a lot of noise. But, true to form, Houdin offers the most logical and rational explanation I've heard, and it all just makes complete sense. When we want to understand the Great Pyramid, simplicity is key. Two geniuses, Albert Einstein and Leonardo da Vinci, knew this principle oh so well. Einstein once said, everything should be made as simple as possible, but no simpler. Da Vinci said, simplicity is the ultimate sophistication, and they're both completely right. Houdin is absolutely convinced the ancient Egyptian architects and engineers, those responsible for the Great Pyramid, were also at this same level of genius. And to say the Egyptians were incapable of building pyramids shows a real lack of knowledge and understanding of the reality of the time. Houdin has showed me that everything can be explained in a simple and coherent way. You just need to get into the minds of the builders of the time. And you can only do that if you devote many hundreds of hours into detailed research, if you maintain an open mind, if you're willing to always be flexible, and if you tackle the problems logically and systematically. Houdin's view on the shafts comes from more than 20 years of study on the Great Pyramid, including a number of observations, not just by him but by others, and it all centres on sound and acoustics. He sent me some quotes, one of which come from the late great researcher Jean Carissel in his book that's shown on screen. Carissel says this of the King's Chamber. Before entering this room for the first time, an incident occurred in the electric lighting circuit. Suddenly the pyramid was in the dark as Muslims in the King's Chamber chanted their prayers. At the top of the Grand Gallery, the sound I was hearing was extraordinary in its breadth and purity. I entered the room to find, lit by a single candle, there was only one Muslim prostrate in the corner near the sarcophagus. Extraordinary amplification. This told Houdan that acoustics were of great importance in the Great Pyramid project, something I know that many others have observed in person and discussed in books and videos. In 2008, Houdan had his own experience regarding the Great Pyramid acoustics. He and his friend were asked to leave the King's Chamber because a meditation group 30 strong had rented it out for an hour. 
Before leaving, Hu Dan and his friends stood and watched as the Grandmaster of the group hit the granite floor with a tuning fork, making a sound that resonated in the room. The granite floor, the walls and the ceiling amplified the sound in an extraordinary way, a resonance that lasted for at least a minute. This group then began chanting before Hu Dan and his friend were asked to leave the pyramid. They did so, but stayed in front of the entrance on the north face, about 50 metres from it. Whilst they were quietly chatting, Hu Dan said to his friend, Do you hear that? Listen. The notes from the tuning fork inside the king's chamber could be heard from outside the pyramid, amid the jumbled voices of dozens of tourists around them. The sound was coming from the exit of the king's chamber northern shaft, high up on the outer edge of the pyramid. They stood looking up and focused on the outlet, situated some 70 metres above the base of the structure. And the more they stared and focused, the more sounds they heard coming from it, including the chanting voices of the meditation group. Then everything stopped, and a few minutes later, the group was seen leaving the Great Pyramid. It's strange because nobody else had noticed anything. And, as Houdan says, it's the kind of event that could only be noticed by someone who is very attentive and very much immersed in researching the finer details of the Great Pyramid. Plus, he was already aware there was a group making noises inside the King's Chamber. For Houdan, it was like he had just witnessed a free scientific experiment on the acoustic qualities of the King's Chamber, and also the associated small shafts, specifically the King's Chamber Northern Shaft. There was cast iron proof that this tiny shaft carried the human voice and the noise of the tuning fork from the King's Chamber through the pyramid and out and could be heard some 50 metres away from the pyramid at ground level in amongst dozens of tourists. Houdin then told me of an observation that was made by French geological engineer Pierre Deletti, who was part of the Great Pyramid EDF mission in 1986-87. One day, two members of Deletti's team were positioned at the outlet of the King's Chamber northern shaft on the northern outer edge of the pyramid. Deletti was inside the king's chamber. Those on the edge of the pyramid were talking to one another. Deletti was confused, thinking he could hear his colleagues just behind him in the portcullis chamber. Then he realised their voices were being transmitted through the northern shaft and amplified by the king's chamber. So, what was Houdan's conclusion? It was clear that the king's and queen's chamber shafts in the Great Pyramid were in fact a means of communication. Communication during the pyramid's construction process. The subject of his email to me was Khufu's Pyramid Intercom, a playful take on the subject matter, but not a bad way to help us understand what these shafts were for. I have to say I do love this idea. I really do being very similar to speaking tubes and voice pipes used on ships and in submarines in the 20th century. But, as always, I was left with a number of questions. If they were used for communication, why were the two Queen's Chamber shafts sealed at both ends? How did they seal them inside the Queen's Chamber when the ceiling blocks were load-bearing? I had more and more questions, and I have to say, Houdan did answer every single one. These shafts were a key part of the huge pyramid project. They were for communication during construction, although we can't discount the idea that the King's Chamber shafts also offered much needed ventilation inside the pyramid. And maybe on completion, they also served another spiritual religious function as well. But when building the Great Pyramid, they did have a very practical function. Communication. How they fit into the wider construction model is far too much information for this video, but for now it's worth noting that the Grand Gallery had a very important function in the building process, being part of a comprehensive counterweight system to hoist the large granite blocks of the King's Chamber and relieving chambers into position. The small shafts are situated very close to the axis of the Grand Gallery. 
And, as you can see, the Queen's Chamber shafts end at the level of the rafters of the so-called relieving chambers. That's because they were in use for the placement of the granite beams via the Grand Gallery counterweight system. They really didn't need to go any higher. They served their purpose in the construction process, and then when they were no longer needed, they were closed up. The Grand Gallery counterweight mechanism would have required a team of workers on the south side of the pyramid and another team on the north, situated around the Grand Gallery. To put it simply, both sets of teams had to communicate with each other in real time, across a large distance, to ensure the blocks of granite moved into position without error. They did this from transmitter posts, which were basically the marked ends of the shafts. A voice or instruction could be carried through one shaft and heard by a person or number of people situated inside each chamber. In the Queen's Chamber, the level of the height of the openings in the north and south walls of both shafts is linked to the level of the head of the average Egyptian of the time. This person or people inside the chamber listened for instructions and then repeated them loudly and clearly, which was amplified sixfold by the incredible acoustics and then transmitted through the opposite shaft. And this is a system that does actually work. The two Queen's Chamber shafts also exited the Great Pyramid at the same level, around 61 metres, even though the north one does bend quite considerably, showing us the two shafts must have worked in tandem. Please note, the Queen's Chamber is made of fine Chura limestone, which, when polished, would have offered the same amplification properties as the granite in the King's Chamber, a fact that's been modelled by Jean-Pierre Houdin, yet not experienced quite as well today because of the deterioration of the limestone. In the King's Chamber, the operator will be in a seated position as the openings are lower. This is because two enormous granite blocks cover the access corridor from the Grand Gallery, which forms two rows of blocks in height. So, the shaft opening had to be lower. I'll go into this more in the future when I begin to explain the construction of the internal chambers, as it is too complicated and too much information for this video. So, as stated, a person or people would have been positioned inside each chamber, and on the construction site, people would have been positioned at specific transmitter posts located at the end of each shaft. A genius concept, and an incredible piece of ancient engineering, but also necessary, considering the size, scale and precision of the pyramid project. Incredible accuracy was required. But why are there two sets of shafts? Two from the Queen's Chamber and two from the King's. Well, that's simply because, as the Scan Pyramid's Big Void shows, there are in fact two Grand Galleries inside the Great Pyramid, which means there were two counterweight systems, just as Jean-Pierre Houdin expected. Two were needed because of the growing height of the pyramid. The second Grand Gallery was used for the highest level granite beams and also the huge chevron blocks on top. This is when the King's Chamber shafts came into use, and the ones from the Queen's Chamber were no longer required. Their work was already done. There is so much more to add, so much more to explain, and I am glossing over a lot of technical detail, but scientifically and practically speaking, the intercom system does work. An incredible example of ancient technology, so sophisticated yet so simple, and I have to be honest and say, it's the best explanation for the pyramid shafts I've seen to date. And I do think it's correct. The doors at the end of the Queen's Chamber shafts were likely added because the surrounding core masonry of the Great Pyramid hadn't reached their height when they were in use. So the doors meant that during the construction process, they could keep out sand, rain and pests. They were probably always closed when not in use as an intercom, to ensure the elements and debris did not compromise their acoustic properties. The only problem I had with this whole hypothesis was how did the shafts open into the Queen's Chamber, when there are two load-bearing wall blocks covering their entrances inside. 
Well, as Da Vinci himself said, simplicity is the ultimate sophistication. And the simple, ingenious explanation that was given to me by Jean-Pierre Houdin really was mind-blowing. Something I had never considered, but again it did make total sense. And I'll discuss this in a follow-up video. I'll just say that they did open into the Queen's Chamber, and there is physical evidence to explain how this was possible, and also how they were closed. Regarding the shafts, I ruled out the star shaft hypothesis long ago because when you look at accurate diagrams, they don't actually point to specific stars, being crooked and bent and not looking like this simplistic diagram we have all seen. I ruled out the idea they contain gas or water as they are not hermetically sealed and so would be totally inefficient. They were also not air shafts primarily, because two out of the four shafts, those from the Queen's Chamber, are closed at both ends. Rudolf Gantenbrink, arguably the world's leading expert on the Great Pyramid shafts, also ruled out every theory, both mainstream and alternative, because nothing actually works. But that was before Jean-Pierre Houdin devised his theory. Houdin's idea is simple and logical, and also explains the need for the acoustic properties of the King's and Queen's chambers. It was so Egyptians could actually build the pyramid to plan, and communicate across a huge construction site quickly and clearly. Houdin even experienced the sound exiting the Great Pyramid itself, through the tiny King's Chamber northern shaft, incredible people have also relayed their experiences. It truly is a genius explanation for the genius ancient engineering on display, used during the building of the most incredible structure the world has ever seen. Thank you very much for watching this episode of Ancient Architects. If you enjoyed the video, please subscribe to the channel, please like the video, and please leave a comment below. Thank you very much.